A story of friendship, courage, Quick, this way. and laughter. <laughs> George Lucas and Steven Spielberg present a Don Bluth film, The Land Before Time, rated G. Starts Friday, November 18th at theaters everywhere. So, I've thought for a long time about how I'm going to put into words my love for this film, and I don't think that I'll ever be able to do it justice. Don Bluth's The Land Before Time, in my mind, is one of the most beautiful films ever made. It's a film that both resonates with me on a nostalgic level, and one that I've only grown a greater appreciation towards in recent years. It's not a perfect movie by any means. There's quite a few structural issues with the film that I'll get around to talking about, but it's the emotional connection I have with it that gives me such a fond love of it. The Land Before Time was Don Bluth's third theatrically released Released animated film. It released back in November of 1988, competing against the likes of Disney with their newest animated film of the time, Oliver and Company. Now, I quite like Oliver and Company. I mean, Why Should I Worry is a banger. Why should I worry? Why should I care? But the release of this film marked a big turning point in Don Bluth's directing and animation career, even managing to outperform Disney at the box office. Although to be fair, The Land Before Time did have big names like Steven Spielberg and George Lucas attached, and I'm certain that that helped. You could also argue that it was partially the beginning of Don Bluth's downfall. I mean, releasing All Dogs Go to Heaven the same month as The Little Mermaid? Not your best idea. And then he released Pebble and the Penguin the same month as a fucking goofy movie? Does this man hate success? <laughs> The Land Before Time certainly made its mark on animation, maybe more so for the endless trashy sequels we had to endure, but I just like to pretend that those don't exist. Let me tell you, I may appreciate the original film more as I age, but those sequels, mmm, mm, no, definitely not, absolutely not. <laughs> Eggs. The Land Before Time tells the story of Littlefoot, a long-necked dinosaur who loses his mother in a battle with a Tyrannosaurus Rex, or a sharp tooth as they call it here. After a fierce quake, he gets separated from his grandparents and meets other young dinosaurs along the way. Littlefoot and his newfound friends must put their differences aside and work together in order to find the Great Valley, a beautiful new home where they can all live together free from harm. All of that sounds basic enough for a children's film, but what I fail to mention is that this film is depressing as fuck. I'll be with you, even if you can't see me. What do you mean, if I can't see you? I can always see you. Littlefoot, let your heart guide you. In the first 20 minutes of this movie alone, we witness the birth of Littlefoot, followed by his mother raising him, giving him wise words of advice, which is then followed up by a life-altering disaster that ends with his mother saying her final words to her child before she passes away. And that's only the first 20 minutes. The rest of this movie is Littlefoot dealing with this grief as he begins to realize that even in death, she will always be with him. On top of that already incredibly heavy subject matter, there's also dealing with the worst evil of all, racism. Come, Sarah. Three horns never play with long necks. Yeah, Triceratops in this are like super racist, especially Sarah's dad. I hate him. And in case you think I'm being too woke or something, this is a quote directly from Don Bluth himself. We came up with another idea, that none of these dinosaurs get along with each other. They all hate each other. They're taught from the time they were born not to associate with each other. That's racism. So yeah, Don Bluth was addressing racism through children's films of the 80s, such as this, and arguably an American tale, all while films like Soul Man were being made by people who thought that we were past all that. Thank you, sir. I'll do my best. Some people yeah. do anything to get into Harvard. It's gonna be great! These are the 80s, man! It's the Cosby decade! The fact that these difficult subjects were being addressed in a children's film so early on is one of the many reasons that I love this film more as it ages. It's like a fine wine, really. It doesn't shy away from these issues, instead delving heavily into them. Movies like Bambi included the death of a mother, but this is the first time that something like that 
something so severe was playing a huge role in an animated children's film. Maybe the death stuff is handled better than some of the racism stuff. I mean, the racist dino stuff is good and all, but it feels a bit lacking by the end of the movie. Like, they could have done more to address actually solving the issue. Although I do believe the overall concept of putting differences aside and working together towards a common goal is well executed here. It definitely gets that point across. I also love this film's use of children as the voice actors. I think it really helps give you a better picture of the trauma that they go through, and everyone here does an excellent job, even if like a quarter of the movie is just children screaming. <laughs> Although I should mention that Petrie was voiced by Will Ryan, who was very much not a kid at the time, but he does well. The only thing missing from this movie is Dom DeLuise, who for some reason is not present in a Dom Bluth film. I mean, what's up with that? And going back to the sharp tooth for a second, this thing is absolutely terrifying for a kid's movie. Like, on par with the T-Rex from Jurassic Park, they really went all out making him scary, which I love. I feel that threats in a movie such as this should still be scary even if you are making a children's film. Now I was the type of kid who was pretty much scared of every movie, but for some reason I'm now really fond of children's movies that go that extra step and don't hold back in the sheer levels of terror they present. Don Bluth was a master at this. I mean his famous quote was, if you don't show the darkness, you don't appreciate the light. Which is a saying that I completely agree with. But I also believe that it's a saying that works vice versa. I've read many reviews calling this movie too childish at times, but the reason I think that works so well is that these characters are children, and yes, even in the face of danger, they would make some sort of attempt to have fun. Don't step on a crack or you'll fall and break your back. It's strange to me just how unapologetically real this movie about talking dinosaurs can be at times. Another aspect of this that makes me love it so much is the fantasy elements it kind of bears. Now I am a big fan of the fantasy genre, and strange enough I think it's this film that probably had the strongest effect on me when I was young. I love the way that each species of dinosaur is referred to by a name that sounds almost tribal, like it comes from their own culture. Long neck, big mouth, three horns, it just makes a lot of sense that they wouldn't use their scientific names, instead relying on physical features to describe one another. Every time I make an attempt at writing a story, I find that ideas from the land before time somehow find their way in there, and I think there's just some level of my subconscious that just latched onto this movie and sees it as the correct way to handle a children's story. But let's not forget that this here is an animated feature, and I can't believe I've come all this way without even mentioning the gorgeous vision. Visuals. This may not have the same level of polish as many Disney films do, but it's just such a gorgeous film that entirely succeeds in taking viewers to an unfamiliar new world that could only exist through animation. The backgrounds in this movie are stunning, and each one perfectly captures the tone that the film is currently going for. The animation is lovely too, I mean who doesn't love that Don Bluth style, it's so unique and has that now nostalgic value to it. The emotions of each character are captured perfectly here as well. I know one of the original ideas while it was being developed was to do this movie without dialogue, which quickly changed after the producers realized it would alienate most kids, but I think if there's any animators who could successfully pull it off, it would be the ones working with Don Bluth on this film. And I cannot talk about The Land Before Time without talking about its music. the music, the beautiful James Horner music. I cannot listen to the soundtrack without getting emotional. It is, in my mind, the most beautiful thing ever composed for a film, and it's a damn shame that I can't use it throughout the entire video in fear of getting some sort of copyright strike because it is just so beautiful. The way in which the soundtrack is used here, every visual syncs up perfectly to the music and makes for an experience that I describe as immersive. <laughs> Thank you. 
and the song in the end credits, the one by Diana Ross that just tops the whole thing off. If we hold on together, I know our dreams will never die. It's just so beautiful, and I don't think words can even describe how the music in this film makes me feel. And obviously, Land Before Time is not without its flaws. The biggest problem I have with this movie, as well as I think most people, is that the film just kind of ends. It's like it skips most of Act 3 and just rushes to the ending. But there is a very good reason for that, and his name is Steven Spielberg. Spielberg, you're great. We love you. But something I will never forgive you for is the way you completely butchered this movie. In fear of the film being too scary, Steven Spielberg had an estimated 11 to 13 minutes of fully finished animation cut from the film. That may not seem like much, but considering that most animated films are fairly short, that's like a sixth of your movie right there. These scenes included an extended battle between Littlefoot's mother and the sharp tooth, and most importantly, a final conflict with the sharp tooth where Littlefoot goes back to save his friends. As an adult, it is just so obvious that there's a huge chunk missing from this movie, and it's infuriating because I love this movie so much, and the fact that there's more than likely a far better version of it out there that we'll never see just breaks my heart. The rumor is the cut footage is completely lost now and may have even been destroyed, so we'll likely never get to see it. But if there's one movie I want a Snyder cut of, it's the full version of The Land Before Time. Somebody help me get, like, release the Bluth cut trending. I really want to see this movie. It is my most desired director's cut of all time, and I will be really bummed out if it turns out that the cutscenes were just completely destroyed. The Land Before Time is such a gorgeous movie, and it's one of those movies that I'd like to believe helped make me the person I am today. I don't know if that's a good thing or not, but this is one of those movies that will forever live on through my memory and will always have a special place in my heart. I wish more children's entertainment was as bold and as daring as this film but maybe the fact that there's so few films like this is what makes me appreciate it so much more. This is a beautiful gem of a movie and one that deserves to be seen by all. We may never get to see the film as originally intended, but I still love it and will hold its themes dear to me until the end of time. Until next time, thank you for watching and goodbye. And they all grew up together in the valley, generation upon generation each passing on to the next, the tale of their ancestors' journey to the valley long ago.